Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, we'll wait for a couple more minutes uh, before I start a talk. I'm seeing uh, uh, the, the attendees uh, coming in. And this meeting is recorded. Okay. Okay, guys, uh, let's get started. Um, let me project my presentation. Okay, okay thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Tao Hong. Uh, I'm an associate professor at uh, UNC Charlotte. Um, this is a, a International Institute of Forecasters ECR virtual meeting. ECR stands for Early Career Researchers Network. I want to thank uh, uh, Sherry, the, cha the chairwoman, for inviting me to give this, uh, this talk. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, consulting research and teaching in energy forecasting. Okay. Uh, but before we get started, I want to caution. So, uh, uh, the following content may contain self-promotional uh, elements that are not suitable for some audiences. Okay, so uh, if people don't like to hear other people talk about their experience, then uh, uh, you know this is not the best meeting for you. Uh, this meeting is being recorded, so uh, my uh, my intention is to share the experience I had, and uh, you know, of course, some of them uh, you know I consider a success. Um, Hopefully, this can inspire some of you and uh, help you know the early researchers and even the early career personnel to to get a get a uh, you know do a better job, be more productive, uh, enjoy the work more. Okay. If you have any questions, please uh, type your question into the chat box, or you can just email me. Email me your question is fine too. So at the end of the presentation, I will. Um, I will answer those questions. Uh, please uh, mute yourself because we have, I think we have many, how many people we have? So right now we have 28 people, uh, people are still coming in. Uh, so please mute yourself so uh, everybody else can hear, can, hear, uh, can hear my talk, okay? So first of all, uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, again, thanks to IF ECR. It's the Early Career Researchers Network. This is a newly established network uh, last year. Um, this is actually based on uh, my proposal to the board. So I proposed to the board, I said, uh, you know, maybe our institute can create some uh, opportunities for earlier you know, early career researchers. Um, then uh, we had Sherry and her, her colleagues together form this, uh, this network. Um, in the last IF meeting that they had, last one was in Saloniki, uh, they had a big gathering uh, right before the, the conference started. So this year, uh, this section is having uh, you know, some exciting plans I'm listing here. So there will be a new webinar in September and there will be some online social events. Um, and there is also a new forum. 
So if you have any uh, questions or comments, please contact the organizing team, basically Sherry and her team, uh, or join the LinkedIn group. Okay. Another thing is about the ISF virtual. Uh, as you all know, if we if we didn't have this uh, COVID-19, uh, we would have the uh, ISF next week in real. Okay, uh, but because of the, the, the global pandemic, we had to postpone it. And then finally, we decided to make it a virtual event uh, slash hybrid with the local team. So it will be the last week of October, all time in GMT. Uh, there's some important dates. Uh, if you haven't submitted your abstract or if you want to change your abstract, you can do that before the end of July. Okay, uh, if you already submitted one and you're fine with it, just leave it there. Uh, we'll take care of it. And then we'll notice, not, uh, we'll notice you about our decision uh, in two weeks after the deadline submission date. And then the registration is early September. And again, the event will be uh, the last week of October. So this will be a, a low cost conference in terms of registration. So you don't, I think if you're a member, you're free. There are some uh, details. If you're not a member, you can check out the details for registration. And we'll have a you know strong lineup of keynote speakers, and we'll have many live uh, live presentations, and we'll also record some of these contributed sessions. So I'm sure you will enjoy uh, enjoy this virtual event. Uh, I'm the program chair, so if you have any questions or suggestions, let me know. So I want to start my talk with this uh, this uh, question: so What is your plan for the next five years? If you're, if you're in your early career, early stage of your career, or maybe you're a student, you just entered graduate school, or maybe you're about to graduate, you ought to think about what you plan to do for the next five years. Okay. Or if you're running a business, that's the you know, that's a question you should ask yourself, not every day, but at least every month or every year. So if I were running a power company, if I were running a power company, or if I were running a, a, a utility company, okay, this is what I'm gonna do, okay? So I will be projecting the annual peaks. I want to figure out, you know, whether the system will grow or not. Uh, I want to, I want to understand where my load is going. Is it going up, going down, or uh, stay flat? And based on that, I'm going to plan my system. Okay. And if, if in order to do that, uh, in order to do that, I need to understand, you know, some short-term patterns too. So basically, if you can't forecast next week, you cannot forecast next year either. Okay, so there's basically no credibility. If you cannot even forecast next day, next week, then how, how can we trust you that you can forecast next year? So there's another set of problems is to, uh, to predict the load or electricity demand of next week. And you know, this doesn't have to be electricity. You can do this for water, for gas. Um, I'm running another, uh, another section in IIF, uh, International Institute of Forecasters. It's called a suite. Okay, sections on water, energy, and environment. So we, can, we, we really care about a lot of these, uh, you know, uh, forecasting problems related to water, energy, and the environment as a whole. Okay, so, okay, back to, back to this, uh, this uh, answer. So if I were running a power company, I need to figure out where my demand is going for the next day, for next week, for next month, for next year, for next five years, 10 years, even 20, 30 years. And that really, you know, that's the field I'm in. Um, that's my core area uh, of practice is energy forecasting or load forecasting specifically. So for a power company, it needs load forecasts for different time scales. Uh, you know, when you look at it uh, from, you know, a few minutes or even second ahead, a few hours ahead, a few days ahead, weeks ahead, month ahead, year ahead, even decade ahead for, you know, energy policy making. So we need all kinds of low forecast. And uh, my, my primary responsibility is to, to invent these forecasting models, to build these models, to help my clients, to help my uh, uh, utility partners, to, to help them improve their forecasting practice. That's, that's what I've been doing for the last you know, 10, more than 10 years, okay. So that's, you know, that's a, a sort of an overview of, of the field I'm in. And, you know, today I'm talking about energy forecasting. But I'm also a professor, okay? So if you are interviewing a, a faculty job, I, mean, I, I was, I had one faculty interview. Yeah, I had one faculty job interview and I got a job. That was seven years ago. Uh, 
that's a question I got asked. So what, what do you plan to do for your next five years? And nowadays, uh, I serve on our search committee and chairing the search committee as well. Um, you know, I ask applicants, what, what's your plan for your, for your next five years? And if you, if you think about a, a, a professor job, okay, if you're a professor, this, there are really three things you do. Uh, there are ser services, research, and teaching. So you do research, service, teaching, or teaching, re research, service. Depending on the, the university you're going to, uh, you know, they may have different emphasis on these uh, uh, different, uh, different categories. Okay, some teaching schools may emphasize teaching more and research schools may, may want you to do more research than teaching. Okay, and services, of course, you have to do it. Right? But here, you know, if I were answering this question, I was years ago. So I'll say, you know, I, my services is really consulting services. Okay, I consider the primary part of my service is consulting. And when you talk about consulting, it's really, I work with companies, okay? Uh, I work with companies, I work with utilities, I work with government agencies, uh, I work with commissioners to help them understand how to build better forecasts, how to, how to defend their models, how to improve their practice. And that's really consulting. And sometimes I do management consulting and sometimes I do you know, uh, analytical consulting, help them build models. And sometimes it's really on roadmap, you know, live services, but still as consulting services. So consulting services and the research and teaching, you know, how do we balance these things? Okay, let's say if we do go to the extreme. So let's say if you're a professor, you only do consulting, then you better work in a consulting firm. Okay. Or if you're a professor, you only do research, then you go to national labs or you go to some research labs. If you're a professor, you only do teaching, then you just, you know, you become a lecturer, okay? You don't do other things, you just become a lecturer. Then you're, really, you're, not, a, you're not really a tenure or tenure track professor, okay? So this will really boil down to the question, how do we, how do we juggle the balls, okay? So I'm showing you a, a clip, okay, this is me, all right? So this is me uh, juggling two balls, okay? So this is uh, one of the basketball drills. I had my son practice and, uh, you know, I, I saw him playing with it and I do it too. So I play basketball too when I was younger. Um, you know, when you have these balls, how do you juggle them? Look at this, look at my moves, okay? In order to juggle these balls, you have to understand how these balls are moving between your legs and, you know, cross over, you know, in your front. And then you have to have a balance, okay? If, you, if one ball is much higher than the other ones, it won't work, you know? Well, actually, uh, if your ball handling skills is very, very good, it may work out, but if for this specific drills, these two balls are supposed to be at the same height, just their trajectories are different. And we have to understand, you know, what we need for these balls and, uh, you know, what we need to do to address these needs. Okay, so in the following three slides, I'm going to talk about these three aspects, the consulting, research, and teaching. I want to start with consulting. So for consulting, we are really dealing with clients. So we work with clients, so we have to understand what they need. And in order for, 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 the, for, the, for the deal to work with us as well, so we, we also need to understand what the clients can offer. Okay, so basically there are two things, what the clients need and what the clients can offer. So clients really need expert advice. So they need, you know, you're, if you're a professor, uh, you'll be viewed as an expert in your field. And if your clients need some help in that specific field, uh, then you might be the one to, to provide the expert advice. And your clients need uh, useful solutions. So they need to get something work, okay? Uh, they don't really need your papers, okay? That's, that's one of the things many professors don't understand. They say, oh, you know, these, uh, you know, these utilities, they don't, they don't support my project. They don't give me data. Uh, well, probably they don't need your papers because, you know, maybe if your only thing is to write papers, if you consider paper the only outcome of your research, then, th you know, that's not what they need, okay? And the clients need workforce development. Okay, so the you know clients need 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 to get uh, uh, up to date information about what's going on in, in today's research academic field. Uh, they want to know you know they want to improve their workforce. So workforce development is what they need, and they need business continuity. Okay, if they have nowadays, we call, I call it mobile workforce. So you rarely see people staying in a job for more than three years. Very rare. Okay. Uh, if, if it's a three, four, five years employee in the same company, that, you know, that must be considered veterans. And even if someone's staying in the same company for five or 10 years, 
most likely this person got uh, you know changed jobs among different departments here and there. So clients need business continuity. A nice thing about professor is that uh, you know professors are on tenure track or tenured, so they tend to stay on a job for a long, long time. So when clients have personnel changes, they may come back to you if you are their longtime partners. Uh, they are you know they may come back to you to figure out you know what happened. In the last few years, you know, they may help you. They may ask you to help train their new, uh, new employees. So that's what they need. Okay, and then think about it. So if if you only address their need but they don't help you, then that's not a fair deal. Okay, so then I, you know, I think about what the clients can offer. The clients can really offer many, many valuable things. So one of them is real world problems. Okay. Um, I'm in forecasting. I bet uh, many attendees of this meeting, you're in forecasting as well. So if you're in the forecasting field, you know, most likely you enjoy working on real world problems. You, you enjoy seeing forecasting models or statistics or econometric models work in the real world. So clients can offer many real world problems. Okay. Uh, client can offer you real world data, right? So uh, nowadays, if you submit a paper to these top journals, at least as far as I know, for IJF, for example, if you just only you only if you only use sim simulated data or so-called synthetic data, uh, most of the time it won't work. You know, your your paper will be rejected. Let's say you want to show oh, my model works, then I use the AR1 to generate a bunch of theories, and then I show oh, my exponential smoothing model works the best. Uh, it doesn't work that way because you already and you already know the underlying process. If you know that process, then uh, you know you know the models. Okay, so. The client can offer you real world data. Uh, there are many, many, many uh, uh, features you can gather from real world data that you cannot really generate from your computer. Okay. And clients can offer funding too. Okay. So if you really, if you can really deliver some useful solutions, you can really help them with their business. You know, it's fair to ask for a compensation, and that compensation typically comes in as as research funding. Okay. And then another thing is, clients can offer you business insights. So they can tell you why the business is run this way rather than the other way. Uh, they can tell you many things you don't know from the university, from the ivory tower. Uh, you know, many of these insights can, can be translated to research, uh, to, 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 to solutions and to, to the selling points in your papers. Okay, very often, uh, you know, I handle papers for these journals and I saw, uh, I saw papers coming in. You know, this paper come in saying, hi, I'm using a particle swarm optimization uh, with a hybrid of uh, with a hybrid together with uh, with a gray, gray wolf algorithm and uh, and B colony B colony and we use it to optimize the parameters for a neural network for deep uh, deep neural nets uh, nowadays deep learning is hot so I, I, we use it to optimize the deep neural nets and then this whole thing gets a better forecast you know point point one percent better accuracy than uh, regression model on low forecasting. And you know, papers like this have spent like five minutes on them and they reject it. Okay, so it's really, you, you didn't address the, the issues, right? So if you say improving forecast accuracy is your goal, then you need to prove and you need to show, you need to demonstrate why this whole combination thing is really good. That means, let's say if you hybrid five of them, okay, if you hybrid five of them, well, I, I mentioned four, so, uh, uh, and and colony gray wolf particle swarm together with neural nets. If you hybrid these five, you need to show how each component works, and how the pairwise components work, and how the you know how any three of them work, and how all four together them work. And you need to show that all four together is better than all the others. And that's not enough. That's you know that's another reason many papers get rejected. They only compare the things, uh, you know, they propose in their in their own components. You also need to compare, that's the most important comparison. You need, to, you need to compare with the state of art. You need to look at what power companies are using today. Uh, that's the state of practice and why yours be done. And if, yours, if your work really be done, why didn't you buy your solution? Okay, that's, that's a tough question to ask yourself. If, if this, you know, you know uh, just randomly name some, Wavelet plus Particle Swarm plus Fuzzy Logic plus Newness, if, if this really works, why didn't they buy your solution, right? So this is my, you know, I'm probably one of the few people in this, in this, in this planet who made money out of flow forecasting, right? So I know a few, I know a few people, a handful of people 
really make money out of the, out of low forecasting, and I'm one of them. Um, if your models really work, uh, if they are really effective, then the clients will buy your models. Okay, this is a very competitive work. If yours really work, then the power companies will buy your solution. I mean, some of them may not buy because of politics or other things involved, but there will be companies buying your solution. Okay, so in other words, if they didn't buy your solution, you need to figure out why. And that's the time you can have them or you can you know, ask for, for a favor from your clients, ask them for business insight. Why didn't they use your solution, okay? Anyway, so this is to understand the client's needs and what clients can offer in the consulting world, okay? Now I'm jumping to research. Research, your, your clients in this case is really your university or your college or your department chair, uh, you know, basically wherever your tenure home is, okay? And here I'm using university to represent the college, the chair, and you know, your, your clients. What do university really need is fame, okay? Your university want to get higher rent and uh, want, to, uh, want to be more famous. Uh, want, they, they all want to be Harvard and Stanford and MIT, okay? I mean, some schools, they obviously can, but uh, they always want to climb up, okay? So that's what your university needs. Uh, that's, if you understand this, then, then you, will, you, know, you will understand the, the, the remaining part. So anything you do is to help your university to become more famous. So one is research funding. So the more research funding you get, and if you get research funding from those uh, you know, competitive agencies like NSF, National Science Foundation, or Department of Energy, or you know, Department of Defense, some of these uh, you know, uh, federal agencies, that means you, you are competitive with, among your peers. You're competitive among your peers, so that makes your university look good, right? So of course, sometimes, or a lot of times, this is really, you know, you're not really competitive in your research, you're just competitive because you had a good relationship with that funding agency. And I've seen that, you know, every year I'm seeing, you know, people getting funded because they know the, they know the program director or, uh, you know, they just had a, their special channel. They had their, you know, they're entrenched somewhere and they got funding, right? There are situations like that happen. But still there are, you know, small portion of money uh, being allocated to, uh, to, to those who are really, really competitive. Uh, if you're one of them, you can help your university to get fame, okay? And here, you know, another one is scholarly publications. Again, this is, a, you know, competitive world too. So those top journals, they don't take every single paper, they, they don't take every single manuscript they, they receive. So, uh, you know, they have, uh, they, they, they have a acceptance rates as well. So um, sometimes 10% or less than 10%, that's really top journals do, you know, do that. IJF is one of those. So IJF accept probably less than 10% of the papers. Uh, at least in energy forecasting in, in, in this field, I mean, uh, you know, we don't accept many papers, less than 10% definitely. And uh, energy forecasting papers so far are the, the highest cited papers in IJF. Among all IJF categories, energy, energy forecasting is, is, is the highest cited area. So uh, very top quality papers publishing, very top quality energy forecasting papers are published in IJF. Uh, when you publish in, in this uh, top journals, you'll help your university be more famous because you know, when your affiliation, uh, your affiliation will show that's your university's uh, name, right? And then think about what the university can offer you, right? So they can offer your tenure, right? Tenure means job security. Once you're tenured, you can basically do any, anything you want. I mean, uh, half of the tenured faculty don't do anything after they get, they get tenured. Right? They just uh, stay chill and uh, you know have fun, enjoy life. But there are you know another half who really do well, and on average, it's, you know tenure system still works. I mean, many people criticize tenure system. Uh, this is like social welfare, right? So many people don't work, and uh, there are a small amount of people who work really hard and uh, get it done and get uh, you know get super productive. And on average, we are moving forward. So that means it works. Okay. And the university can offer collaborative environments. That means you are not really on your own. You can find your colleagues. You can find people from other schools. Overall, this academic environment is supposed to be more collaborative rather than siloed. And that help, help getting, you know, help marry, marry different, uh, different research fields together and help spark new ideas, uh, help move the, the knowledge, push the, push the knowledge uh, boundary. And the university can offer students, okay. Uh, well, in general, uh, 
Uh, most of the time, you, if you're if you're in a you know top ranked university, the students may be more hardworking, maybe you know had better uh, uh, academic, more solid academic backgrounds. But there are good students everywhere. So uh, you know, don't complain, don't complain about your, your university. Don't complain about your students. I mean, there are good students everywhere. Uh, you know, if you're good enough, you can attract good students, right? So uh, once the students you enroll in academic programs. Uh, you know they can learn they can learn stuff from many other faculties by taking classes, and then uh, once they get those nu nutrition, they work with you and help with your field. Okay, so that's what the university can offer. And finally, think about teaching. Okay, teaching you're you're really talking to students. So think about what the students need. Right? Students need a research topic. They need a research topic to graduate. Okay, assuming that's a research student. Okay, even for uh, you know for for non-thesis or non-dissertation students, they still need to do some research if we are talking about graduate schools, okay? And students need stipend, okay? They need money, they need to make a living. And that stipend typically is not, not, not much, but uh, they help them uh, make a living. Uh, well, students need jobs, so they, why do they go to school? Well, you know, partly because they want to find a job. Okay? And then uh, a last, but not, definitely not least, they, they need to get better, okay? They need to get improvement, okay? They need to, they need to get improved. And actually this is you know, very unfortunate. Uh, most students don't know they really need this. They don't know they, they go to school to get better. Uh, they thought they go to school to get a di diploma, but that's actually getting that diploma only, is only like, a, it's, it's, a, it's just that moment they got a diploma and after that, it doesn't mean much, right? So what they really learn from school means means a lot, and uh, unfortunately, most of them don't know what they don't know they need to get better, and most of them uh, go to those easy courses uh, uh, and uh, try to get A's from by by going to to the to the easy going professors. Uh, but uh, you know, if you can find the students who really want to get better, that's great. And what a student can offer, the student can definitely offer labor, okay? They have hours, they can spend hours and hours in the lab. I remember when I was in graduate school, I, that was from 9 a.m. in the morning to midnight. So from 9 to 11.30 some. Uh, and at that time, my school didn't have, uh, you know, you can stay there overnight. So uh, I worked really hard in graduate school. Uh, you know, my hours definitely paid off, okay? Uh, we'll talk about this later on. A student can offer labor. So there are a lot of things, you know, you do this, you know, time and time again, uh, it's no longer productive for you to do it. If you teach students to do it, it's their first time, second time, they will spend a lot of time, but they may save some of your time. And once they do that, they, uh, they, they get better and they help them, uh, those exercises help them uh, find, find better jobs. Okay. And students can offer ideas if you're lucky. Okay, so, um, Sometimes, well, actually most of the case, advisors give students, hey, you work on this, you do this task every week, you do this and that. Uh, well, this, this, I guess most of the case. And sometimes uh, some students get creative, they can create their own ideas, or maybe they can, they can get some uh, uh, improvements on your ideas. So that would be great, okay? And another thing, you know, that's what I find, you know, really a couple years after my professor job. Students can, can, can offer bragging rights, okay? So why I say that? When I first went, went back to school, um, well, initially I was a graduate student and then uh, I went to industry to work. I worked six, five, six years before I went back to school to, be a, to become a professor. You know, I, at that time I just enjoyed teaching. I enjoy research. So that I, I thought if I do teaching and research, uh, you know, professor job will be a good, a good opportunity for me. So I went back. And then I started teaching and started doing research and started to bring up my own students. And then they, you know, I send them to those competitions. Uh, you know, one of them was a global energy forecasting competition. And I send, you know, I, I, I place them uh, in the job market. And then I realized that's the real joy. Okay, the real joy is not really research and teaching. The real joy is that you can bring people up. Okay, you can, you can change people's life. So I'm here, I'm showing a, a picture. So this is uh, you know, one of my students who graduated uh, last year. And then like after half a year after graduation, he, he came back. I mean, he, you know, this is, his name is Sarap. Uh, he, he was from a, a small village in India. Um, 
I guess he came to school, he, he came to the United States on a, on, on a loan. Uh, and then, uh, you know, making small, almost not making money at all at the beginning. And then I took him and become my research assistant and teaching assistant. Uh, you know, we worked together on some tough problems. Uh, before coming to me, he didn't know anything about programming. Uh, you know, I, I was shocked. Like he had an engineering degree, but he didn't know programming. But he really learned from scratch. And uh, I gave him a tough, very tough programming intensive in t programming intensive task and uh, you know you use it for for his uh, master thesis topic and he nailed it i did a great job and then uh, when he was graduating there were many big companies chasing him and finally he went to a, a fortune 50 company uh, in uh, with a six digit salary uh, within a couple months he came back to me riding a bmw he was showing his car showing off his car this is after a, a a, a lunch we had with the group and he was showing off his car. I took a picture with him standing by his car. And you know, those were the moments I really enjoyed. I, I see these people, these students, when they came to the United States, they had nothing. And then they accomplished their uh, American dream. I mean, this is probably too early to say accomplishing a dream, but uh, apparently this changed their, their life, uh, make it better. So that's the bragging rights I have, right? So I can brag about this student, that student in front of anybody, I can say, hey, you know, for all of you who are in UK, you know, you're, you know, my student went to those NPOWER competitions every year in the past, and uh, we beat all UK school students. So no matter you're from Cambridge or Oxford or whatever top schools in UK, you can be my students, right? So that's the breaking right I have. Um, so I think that's a real enjoyment of, of, of a professor job. Uh, and now it's really time to connect the dots. So after I saw, you know, I talked about consulting and research and teaching, how do we connect these? You know, if, if sitting on a professor's chair, you know, you have to you know, put these together and make it work for you. You have to balance those. You know, think about it, I was juggling two balls, right? How do I juggle those? And there are three of them, so consulting, research, teaching, three of them. How do I juggle three, three balls? So one is you need to get, you know, research funding from your consulting project, all right? It's simple, right? So you work on consulting project and deliver good solutions and get research funding. Use that money to support students and have students help you with those projects. And then you work with your student clients to come up with solutions to those problems, right? And then after that, you work with your student to publish your findings, okay? Sometimes your clients is, you know, willing to work with you on the papers too, right? And then you publish them at the top journals. And typically, if this work is impactful, it's useful work and there's some, something, some nuances over there. Most likely you can publish in some top journals, top menus, okay? And then with these, your student gains some real world experience, okay? Then you can help your student land jobs at your client's companies. I mean, that works. So I had multiple students just working in the, you know, in the companies that, uh, uh, you know, they did research with, okay? And then finally, you can bring those business problems to classroom. Think about it. You work on a, on a, on a real world industry project and you publish in, in, in journals, okay? So those research work are reproducible yeah, and it's important that your research work is reproducible. And then you can sort of carve out these problems, you know, dissect it, dissect these problems and bring them to the classrooms. And then see, you know, which students can, can answer these problems, you know, in a smart way. And this help you attract and select students too, right? So if for the students who are not interested in these problems, definitely they, you know, they don't belong to your research group. And for the ones who are interested and the ones who can provide good solutions, then they're good candidates to come to your group. And then this basically complete the loop. And then with these students, you have additional resources and then you can get more projects and bring in more money to support even more students. Then you can grow your research group, right? So this is how we connect the dots, okay? How I connect the dots. I want to give you an example, okay? So this example is a probabilistic load forecasting. I, I'm pretty sure at this stage, you may have a lot of doubts, right? So how, how can we turn these consulting project to, to papers? How can we generate these you know, research outcomes, right? So you, you, we may be able to get some, some money, but very often you know, we send paper to journals and then the reviewer said, oh, this is a consulting report. This is not a journal paper, right? So I'm giving you an example. So this is a, a project I did for a local utility in North Carolina, okay? Um, their business need is to predict their peak load and they want to manage their risk. So this is for risk management. They want to manage their risk. Right? 
So in order to manage their risk, you know, our, my solution is to tell them, okay, not only tell them their, their, uh, their expected load, okay? Expected load is, is basically mean, mean of your predictions. It, I, I want to give them some percentiles or some distribution of their load. So that means, oh, your load, you know, your, the worst situation, your load can be this high. Or in the mild situation, you know, your load can be this low. So I'll give them some band. So this is really probabilistic load forecasting. In other words, I'm generating forecast in the probabilistic fashion. So I'm providing quantiles, I'm providing, I'm providing scenarios with probabilities, I'm providing distributions. Okay, those are the outcome of the load forecast. So I'm providing probabilistic load forecast. So when they receive this kind of forecast, they were you know, sort of surprised. They were like, you know, our high load cannot be that high, okay? But well, once they use the forecast, the second year it shows, right? The second year their high load went to as high as I predicted because the second year was a cold year. They, had, they were a winter peaking utility. The second year was a cold year. Um, you know, they thought I'm a magician, but I'm not, right? So I didn't predict the second year is a cold year. I predict if the second year is, is cold, your load can reach this high. Okay, but if the second year is mild, your load will be, you know, your normal load will be there. But because of that prediction of, of high extremes, they were able to prepare for a cold winter. Okay. What's worse is, you know, if you generate a forecast, if you tell the clients, oh, your next year's load is three gigawatts, but you didn't tell them, oh, it could be eight gigawatts. If they didn't prepare for the worst situation, then when, when they really eight gigawatts, then there are many, you know, there will be blackouts, you know, many people don't have power in the winter, then people may die out of it. Okay. So in this case, they got prepared. So I saved them a lot of money and, uh, you know, they started trusting me and giving me more money and more, you know, more projects. And I use it to, to fund more students. Okay. And for those of you who were, who had doubts about papers and just take a look at uh, the journal publications I had since 2014. Uh, these are the publications about probabilistic forecasting. Okay. If you look at all these, I just pick out my publications related to probabilistic forecasting starting from the very first one, this picture, this picture was taken from this paper, Long-Term Probabilistic Low Forecasting at Normalization. And this was actually a prize paper. It won a, a prize from HVE committee. So it's also a highly cited paper. So now this paper had more than 200 citations on Google Scholar. So all these, paper, all these papers are about probabilistic low forecasting. Basically from there, we find many problems and issues we can solve, we, you know, we can tackle in the probabilistic load forecasting world. And within seven years, we had you know, more than 10 papers and this number is still growing. So and take a look at these journals, transactions on smart grid. I think the impact factor is 10 or something, 10 impact factor. And IJF is definitely a top journal in forecasting. All these are in good journals, right? So uh, I mean, this is just to show you something possible, right? So we can, we can, work on consulting projects and find nuances in these business problems and tackle them and publish the results, okay? And just to show you another example. So this example is about weather station selection. So the problem worked like this. So many utilities working on load forecasting, they, you know, they select, they, they just go with one or two or three stations, one or two or three weather stations, because weather is a key driving factor of electricity demand. But I came to the field, I was like, there's you know, tons of weather stations out there. Why do you only pick one, two, three? And then I, you know, I work with uh, my collaborators and clients. We invent this weather station selection algorithm. So this paper was published in 2015, okay. With this weather station selection scheme, we can improve the forecast by a big margin. And this is, you know, the picture shows you Florida and we were selecting weather stations for this Florida UT for the different areas, okay? The highlighted stars means the station selected for the highlighted region, okay? So this is another example. Again, this paper was published in 2015 at the uh, International Journal of Forecasting. Uh, this is one of the highest cited IJF paper during that period, okay? So this is just to show you another example. I mean, there are many of those examples. You can take a look at uh, my publication and, uh, you know, uh, majority of them are from these, these projects, okay? So I've got a few tips, okay? The first one is really effort won't betray you, okay? So you may not see outcome today, tomorrow, or even this month, this year, but if you do this every day and just 
do it and work hard. Eventually you will see something out. Okay, so as I said, when I was a graduate student, I worked really hard, uh, you know, from nine to, from nine to midnight, from nine in the morning to midnight. Uh, there was a period of a couple of years I was working full time and uh, pursuing my PhD. It took me two years to get my PhD while working full time. So you can imagine how much, how much workload it was. So at the end, I got it. I got a PhD and that gave me, you know, a good path in the industry and also uh, enable me to teach in the university. Okay, so think about what PhD is. It's really a license, to, a license to teach in the university. And in today's work, you really need a PhD to be a professor. Okay. And another thing is, uh, you know, you need to learn to enjoy working hard, right? So people feel working hard is a torture, but if you really enjoy working hard, then working hard is a joy, right? So enjoy working hard, then, uh, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a pressure anymore. Okay, so just keep working hard and make it happy. Another thing is uh, the journey is more important than the destination, okay? And think about it, uh, you know, I guess the ultimate destination for PhD traditionally in a traditional view is to be a professor. But when I graduated, I, I, I didn't even want to be a professor. I mean, I went to industry. So that, that destination from, from my advisor's pr perspective, from my PhD advisor's perspective, is probably not a, not the optimal destination, right? But you know, I learned it. I learned it, and I, along the way, I went to industry. I learned a lot in the industry, many field experience that I would I would have not gained from schools. Then you know, I enjoyed that journey, and then that helped me come back to school. Okay, so because I had this unique experience when I interviewed for the job, and uh, you know, I interviewed one school and got the offer. And that's very rare. Okay, that's very rare. And you know, if, if, you're, if you have interviewed for a faculty job, you send your resumes to 100 schools. Hopefully, you know, three of them, five of them gave you, gave you on-site. And, uh, you know, one of you gave me an offer. But in my case, I sent my resume to one school and got an offer from this one school. And then another thing is to learn from the best people, but be yourself. Okay, so I, along the way, I learned from, from, from the top-notch people along the way. Okay, so when I was... When I was in graduate school, um, typically uh, students structure their graduate committee uh, by listening to their advisor. So basically getting the friends of their advisor. And in my case, I didn't do that. Okay, I basically I talked to my advisor, I want to find the best professor I know of uh, in this school to, to be on my committee. So I find the best, the, the best time series forecasting professor I know of, who was Dave Dickey, Dr. Dr. Dickey. The, the, the guy who co-invented Dickey Fuller test. So I pull him on my committee and I find the best, uh, uh, the best professor in, uh, in optimization in my school, uh, Shu Chen Fang. So I pull him in, on, on my committee. So I basically find the best people in my committee to help me with my, with my dissertation. And after, after uh, graduation still, you know, I, you know, when I, on my first job, I had my mentor, Jim Burke, you know, the best known power distribution engineer uh, in the power field is a power distribution engineer in the field. Uh, life fellow in IEEE and got his big, big awards from IEEE uh, to be my mentor. And I listened to every single word he, he told me. I, I took every single advice he gave me. Right? And uh, when I tap in, uh, in the forecasting field, uh, I learned a whole lot from Rob Heinemann. Uh, Rob, Rob Heinemann okay? uh, he was the former EIC of IJF. Uh, you know, he, he wrote a blog called Hindsight, okay? I, I don't think it was called Hindsight before. Yeah, when I knew him, I think the blog was called Research Tips or something. And then they changed the name to Hindsight. That's the blog you're seeing today. Um, you know, learned a whole lot from him, uh, both on forecasting, you know, techniques and, you know, details, as well as, uh, you know, uh, working habits, productivity, research productivity. I mean, I learned a whole lot from him. So he's a great guy to, to follow. If you are, if you are not a follower of him, you know, do it. Okay, follow his his Twitter, follow his blog. So uh, it's a it's a great great uh, you know great resource for your career. But as I said, you know, you, you learn from these people, but uh, be yourself. Okay, I don't want to become another Rob Heinemann. I don't want to become another Dave Dickey. I don't want to become another Jim Burke. I want to be me, right? So once you learn from them. Then see where you can where you can be, uh, how you can contribute to the society, and do it your way. I mean, you know, do it.
do the best to your community, do the best to your field, uh, do your way um, uh, with the stuff you learn from these people, and then eventually you become the best of you. Okay, so I, I think that's important. And then last, uh, inspire others uh, through this. You know, when you are when you are getting some accomplishments, uh, others want to get those accomplish, uh, accomplishments too. So uh, help others. Uh, try your best uh, during that period you will make new friends uh, you might inspire yourself during that during that process too so uh, you never know it just it just creates a ton of opportunities you know if you're one person you help 100 people these 100 people help another 100 people then your environment suddenly get better all right think about it everyone you know along you two degrees from you three degrees from you they all got improved that means your environment can improve so that's good for you right uh, so those are a few tips and last but not least, I want to I want to share with you something I've been doing uh, during the quarantine. Okay, so we were all locked down at home. Uh, you know, I was, I'm a professor. I don't want to be limited by my job description. Okay, so I love to teach. I love to do research. I love love to do consulting. But still, you know, I love kids too. So I have I have my son, right? My son Leo. This is my son, and uh, he's. Uh, Right now, this one is he's doing jump rope. Okay, so he's one of the best jumpers in the United States for his age group. Uh, this year he might get a medal. So, uh, you know, he I I, I t since he is not going to school because of the quarantine, and uh, I have to teach him at home. And I figured if I teach him, I'm spending time. Why don't I help others to teach their kids? So then I started this called Charlotte Math Meetup. Okay, so this is a math meetup originally. When I started, it was only to the local local kids, and then I opened it to some outside kids as well. So basically, I taught these kids how to do math, uh, how to do these uh, math Olympia problems, you know, these tricky math problems. And the way I taught these problems is, is not the same as as a conventional math math training. So, for example, I, I really put these life stories into these problems, and I put some research there. So, I mean, research topics there. So here, there was a problem. Uh, by the way, this is RAMP, Random Math Problem. So this is the online, online book I'm writing with my son. Okay, so both me and my son are making, making up these math problems and uh, he's providing solutions to these problems and we're going to publish it. And right now, this is online. So everyone can, get, can see it and that's free. And that meetup is free too. So this is free, open to the public. And then uh, we put, uh, we put uh, the YouTube recordings. Uh, we, we put recordings on YouTube so everyone can see it. Again, just to help others and inspire others. And here, I, my major is optimization, operation research. So I put a scheduling problem. Uh, I put a, uh, a scheduling problem to the kids. And these are elementary school kids, and uh, help them have them, you know, explore some of these uh, graduate school or college problems. So this is a scheduling problem. I uh, revise it into a into a jump rope warm up story and uh, let the kids work on. It. So, and. Sometimes I gave them a graph theory problem. And sometimes I gave them some uh, some algebra problems. So you know, let them let the kids explore some of these uh, advanced math or applied math, right? Um, so that's all from my talk. I you know I want to leave another ten minutes or so for a Q and A. Uh, you know, again, thank you for your time. Many of you are not in the, in the, in the working hours for your time zone, so. Uh, again, thank you for coming here. You know, in your early days or late late night. So, if you have any problem uh, questions, please send it to me via chat box. Oh, photos. Oh, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. If you have any problem, you can just type it to the chat box. Oh, I, sh I see Sherry online. Uh, Sherry, do you want to say anything? Uh, this is really, you know, thanks to you. Without you, you know, there wouldn't be this, uh, this webinar. Do you want to say anything, Sherry? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can hear you. Okay, great. No, I just want to thank you for this talk. It was absolutely fantastic. It was nice to learn about your own experience. Um, and I think it was a really 
good talk for early career researchers, um, you know, to learn about the process and all of your tips. So I just want to thank you and I want to thank the audience for being there. And I see that there's a question appearing. So um, two of them even. So I'm going to hand it back to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Yeah, there are two questions. One is Wumi and uh, one is uh, Abhishek. So both of them were about uh, deep learning. So I want to uh, just briefly talk about this. Uh, recently, in the recent few years, um, there was another wave of neural nets and this coming in a deep way, uh, deep learning. And this is, I mean, neural nets is not new, okay? So in 1980s, uh, you will find neural nets paper um, for low forecasting, okay? Uh, I think the peak was late 1990s. Uh, and then early 2000s, it's sort of dying down. And in 2010s, it's sort of almost dead. And then this deep learning came, uh, you know, the, the way of a, the, the wave of deep learning comes back and then uh, a lot of researchers are diving into this deep learning for, for, for low forecasting or for many other applications. And by the way, actually low forecasting, electricity demand forecasting, low forecasting is actually one of the best known, if not the best known application field for neural nets. So at the time there, you know, people were trying to apply neural nets to many fields and uh, you know, with limited success and mostly they stay in the theoretical level, stay in journals, but uh, low forecasting was really one of the fields that uh, there were commercial product that's based on neural nets, okay? And in terms of deep learning, I would really, you know, I would say, you know, if, if you want to dive into this, this area of research, pay attention to reproducibility. You want to make sure your work is reproducible by others and it's easily reproducible. I'm not saying, oh, you know, they, they have to get you the same code and run on the same computer on the same day. That's not reproducible. You know, think about it, it, it ought to be, it ought to be anybody using, you know, some other machines can reproduce your code, you know, maybe a year later, okay? Because we're in a heavily regulated industry. Um, for these forecasting models, in many occasions, you have to defend them. These power companies have to defend them. And for short-term forecasting, maybe defensibility is not really, that important but still uh, in order for industry to use your stuff to use deep learning models uh, they have to be easily uh, easily reproducible portable and traceable if there's something wrong they need to trace back to to you know pinpoint out why why there's something wrong as far as i know there was a without naming the the, the vendor and the utility so there was a very big power company uh, who was well known in the field who was using a, a well-known solution in the field, which is based on neural nets. And finally, the company dropped the solution because there was a winter and suddenly that solution, that the commercial product gave very bad forecast. And nobody knows why the forecast was bad. Uh, I mean, in hindsight, it's probably just overnet, uh, neural nets overfitted uh, the data. And then, you know, sometimes you overfit, uh, you do an okay forecast and sometimes you overfit. And then in some days, it just gave you a very bad forecast. But the problem is, uh, you know, neither the vendor nor the, the user can tell why it's, you know, why just for those specific days their, the forecasts were bad. And that gave a lot of discomfort to the, to the, to the customer. So that's why customer is dropping, one of the reasons customer dropping the solution. Okay, so if, you, if, you, uh, if you're in the field, you try to uh, create deep learning solutions. I mean, they're gr great tools, but you have to use it in the correct way and make sure you adopt to the, to the business needs of, of the industry. And Paula asked the question, this is Paula from Brazil. Uh, she is in our ISF, ISF uh, organizing team. So again, uh, we'll have a hybrid ISF. Uh, it will be virtual and there will be some local celebrations too. So stay tuned, okay? Uh, Paula was asking about the impact of COVID in energy sector. I mean, I didn't do much of, uh, of the, uh, the, you know, the, the measure in, in details. As my clients, for example, uh, you know, either they don't care or the, the impact is very small. I can tell you in general, because of the quarantine, many people are staying at home. So residential loads, the, the, the electricity demand from the, from the residential sector tend to go up, okay? Uh, and then because of the, the low in the factories and the commercial space, the commercial and the industrial uh, load were going down. So that's sort of the general, a general observation and for companies they are having both they're, they're having a good mix of customer they don't see much impact 
And for those industry heavy areas, they may see a dip. Okay, for those uh, companies who, who are in rural, uh, rural areas serving rural residential communities, you will see a bump. Okay. Uh, Abhishek asked about question about probabilistic forecasting. Can I begin probabilistic forecasting with existing forecasting using deep learning? I mean, the answer is definitely yes. So actually, uh, we did some research about this. We were trying to connect probabilistic forecasting with point forecasting. So in other words, we were trying to show that if you have a good point forecasting model, and most likely it can be translated to probabilistic low forecasting models. Okay, you can go to find a paper. I want to show you a paper. Um, there was a paper, oh, here. Uh, pro, paper number eight, I think. This is about variable selection methods for probabilistic, probabilistic low forecasting. So this is sort of connect, this is bridging points and probabilistic low forecasting. It's basically saying, if you have, you know, if you select the models based on point forecast accuracy, uh, most likely that probabilistic forecast accuracy is, is, is good too. I mean, it's not optimized, but it's good too. So if you have good, a good point, you know, deep learning based point forecasting model, you can use it for probabilistic forecasting as well. Uh, thank you, Raj, for the comment. A peak load forecasting is still open problem. What are the best approaches to explore? Oh, great question. So this is uh, asking about peak load forecasting. Is that still an open problem? Definitely, yes. Actually, I have a student right now, a PhD student working on peak load forecasting. So uh, it is definitely an open problem. Uh, you know, one of the good things about forecasting is, uh, uh, you know, the forecasts are always, the, you know, all the forecasts are wrong and uh, uh, you can always improve your forecast. In the past many, many decades, people were really looking at forecasts, you know, load forecasting as the profile, already profiles. Let's say if I want to forecast tomorrow's peak, I will be forecasting tomorrow's hourly profile and then figure out the peak, okay? And if I want to forecast next year's load, then, you know, many people directly using peak load of previous years to forecast next year's. Neither of these is, op is optimal. So there are still a lot of open research problems in, in, in peak load forecasting. So Adam Green, for someone starting in energy forecasting industry, what level of education is necessary? Is honors in engineering enough? Or would you recommend master or PhD? Well, Adam, I don't know what degree you have, where you got a degree and what majors you have, but uh, my general recommendation to to a broad audience to advance your, advance your education as, you know, whenever you get a chance. And this is one of the things actually I was facing this, I was facing this decision uh, 12 years ago. Okay, at that time I just got my master's and I already got a job offer. I was going to, and I actually accepted the offer, okay. And uh, I was going to just take the job and work in the industry with a master's degree and, you know, my advisors was, and my committee members were, were, were like, well, Tao, you're wasting your talents. They, were, they all wanted me to stay. So then I went back to the company. I said, well, I signed, I signed offer. So I will stay if you want me to stay. But uh, you know, there's an opportunity. I can continue working on my PhD. Hopefully I will work hard and get it done quickly. Then you know, as an employee, you will be having an even better employee, a more knowledgeable employee. And luckily my company, at the time, really, my manager at the time, really supported my uh, my 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 you know my request. Uh, they supported my PhD, and they continued supporting me while I was in school. And then after graduation, I went back to the company and keep working there. So, my recommendation is, whenever you get a chance, advance your advance your education. It doesn't have to be a degree program. And nowadays, there are many online courses. Uh, you know, I'm trying to take a online course every year. Uh, sometimes I can't really catch up, but uh, I try to uh, learn something new. Uh, try to learn something new. Keep learning. Be a life, life learner. Okay. One of my my collaborators, also my clients, is Tom Lyon. Tom Lyon. So you know, he's like paper number six was with Tom. So he really, you know, he's a life learner. I learned a, a whole lot from him as well. You know, he loves to learn. He had that curiosity, and uh, you know, he's already VP at uh, at the power company. But uh, you know. He never stop learning. So uh, keep learning, you know, you never regret. Oh, this is a great question. So Bauman, 
Do you have any advice on how to initiate a research partnership with the organization? And what's the role of the university in that regard? This is a great question. So I should have touched this, but I, 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 you know, I didn't. And thank, thank, thank you for the question. Um, how, basically, the question is how to get started. You know, if, if, if you just get into this field, how do you get started with these, with these, uh, these companies? Right, so one of the things, you know, there are a few, a few approaches you can take. One is to work with other people, uh, we work with other senior, senior people and work with them and uh, try to leverage their connections. Okay, that's one. Or if you, you know, you can hustle yourself, right? So go, go to LinkedIn, go to conferences and pre present your talk, present your work. And very often, I got many inquiries, you know, through those, uh, those conference pre presentations as well. There are many people come to me asking for help. And, you know, those people I didn't know before, but uh, after the, the, the conference, they knew me and they knew, oh, I may have a solution to their problem, okay? And once you got those, right, don't, don't waste those opportunities. So make sure you work hard, right? Work hard and, uh, you know, you know, work sincerely. Uh, that's why I said, you know, keep, enjoy working hard and make it a habit. Uh, don't be a slack person, right? So uh, keep working hard and uh, gradually build trust. And once the trust is there, you know, it's, it's easy. Right. And the university in this case will be a university, of course, will take a cut, right? So you'll bring in research funding through the university, uh, university take a, take a cut to, to feed those chancellors and deans and associate deans and associate directors and directors and all these other titles. Uh, but still, you know, as I said, university can offer you a good environment. Okay, so, so this question is from Sujel, how can such a probabilistic forecast be useful in system level planning, such a unit commitment and reserve requirements? Are these probabilistic in, uh, in information easy to in, uh, integrate into existing operational pipeline? Definitely yes, right? So think about this. Uh, originally when you plan, you find the so-called normal year. So it's one series. And then you plan your unit commitment and you, you do your reserve requirement on one series. And many companies do this on three series, three time series. So there will be a severe, there will be a normal, there will be a, a severe, a normal, and there will be a mild, okay, a low. And then if you have more of these, uh, more of these uh, uh, trajectories, okay, if you provide more quantiles, then you can run your unit commitments on more scenarios. For each scenario, run one and make sure your commitment is good. Your, uh, you know, you have enough reserve, reserve for for the for the system to 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 avoid blackouts or brownouts. Oh, Paula, okay, thank you for the, for, the, uh, for the confirmation. Yeah, Paula said they observed the same effect in Brazil. Yeah, I wish we can go to Brazil for the ISF. <laughs> okay. Thank you, guys. Okay, when you add uh, in electricity, nodal price forecasting fundamentally more difficult than load forecasting. Do you have any experience, say, energy trading companies? Oh, this is another great, uh, great question. So Wei Yuan was asking about uh, uh, price forecasting versus slope forecasting. I think price forecasting is indeed a more difficult problem than load forecasting because of the drivers. So if you look at load forecasting, the driver is really, you know, uh, human activities and, uh, and uh, uh, weather, okay? And nowadays with these so-called active demands, so people can tune their ACs, people plug in, uh, plugging in electric vehicles and people putting in these solar panels, they make load forecasting a lot more difficult than before. But still, uh, the driving factors is not that com complicated. Okay, it's not that complicated. Uh, on the other hand, price forecasting is affected by so many other things. You know, congestions is a big thing, right? Congestions and losses and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, these uh, generator outages and things, you know, they all affect your price. And of course, your demand, right? Load is also, a, affecting it also affect your driving the price so fundamentally there are more balls you have to juggle for price forecasting but in terms of difficulty uh, uh, it's hard to compare this is not an apple to apple comparison because for low forecasting my clients ask for like two three percent error okay for price forecasting that's not what your that's not what what people need they don't need to care like for example if you forecast at night they don't care your your forecast error okay you're 10 percent off that's okay Right, because at night the price is fairly stable and this is fairly low. Uh, people don't care those hours, right? On the other on the other hand, price forecasting, you know, people really care about, you know, spikes. Can you predict the spikes? Can you predict how high the spikes is and when the spikes happen? 
So those are, you know, the requirements are different, okay? And I do have experience with energy trading companies. Um, you know, they use, they, you know, many of them use my low forecast and they are, some of them use my low forecast to, to generate price forecast. So uh, both, yeah. Okay, I think that's all the questions we have. Um, yeah, uh, if there's no more questions, it's 12.05, we're already five minutes over. So I want to thank you everyone for, uh, for attending this, this talk. Uh, we will, I will put the recording on YouTube. So hopefully this recording works well. Um, if you miss anything or if you want to share the video with others, feel free to do so. Um, send me emails if you have any questions. Uh, again, uh, please stay safe. Hope we all get through this, uh, this difficult period quickly. Okay, bye guys.